Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Beauvais with another episode of The Yacking Show, your source for health and wholeness. And we help you find that by bringing you interesting guests. Today's is certainly no exception. But first of all, let's introduce co-host Kathleen Beauvais. Hi, Kathleen. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, Peter. Thank you. And thank you also very much for tuning into our show. We so appreciate having you. And as Peter mentioned, we do have another special guest with us today. We are so privileged to welcome Jeff Nelligan to the show. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Hey, Kathleen and Peter. It's a privilege. It's my privilege to be on. So thanks for having me. <laughs> Good to have you. Well, Jeff is a father of three boys and a well-known commentator in the world of American parenting. His most recent work is the second edition of Four Lessons for from My Three Sons, How You Can Raise Resilient Kids, in which he outlines his parenting techniques. Uh, he's an accomplished communications professional with 25 years of senior level political experience. And today he's here to yak with us about raising resilient kids. So let's just jump right in. Jeff, you have three success successful sons. What motivated you to write a book about parenting? Well, I had just dropped, and I'll jump right to it. I had just dropped the third kid off, the youngest, at West Point, the United mm -hmm. States Military Academy. Wow. And I had drove and I drove home and I was sitting in the backyard for the first time with nothing on a schedule. No games, no academic events to be at, no um team parties or anything. And I thought, you know, this is the end. My uh, eldest kid had just graduated from officer candidate school, the United States Navy. And I just had another kid graduate earlier that month for from the United States Naval Academy. All three were gone. And so the idea just came in my mind, you know, they're launched. What did, what happened in all the parenting that uh, allowed them and propelled them to these three places. And of course I had three great mentors behind me that I had been reading for years that seemed to give animus to a book on parenting. One was Lenore Skenazy of the Let Grow Movement, who mm -hmm. was very, very fulsome and remains so about giving kids freedom and independence mm -hmm. at an early age, which I did. The second one was Gene Twenge, Dr. Gene Twenge, who has written for decades about intergenerational elements and changes and dynamics. The third was, of course, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, whose recent book, Anxious Generation, has really caused a stir in this country and probably in Canada as well, just talking about the absolute pathological addiction kids have and, uh, and adults to digital media. Oh, yeah. So. With that kind of framework in mind, I thought, hey, here, let me think about what I can kind of advise parents who may be starting out now that my kids, as I said earlier, are launched. And that's how the book came about. I want to add a, an addendum. Mm -hmm. That was in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I had concerns about Generation Z, which, um, which all three of my sons were members of. And five years later, I had a hundred times the concerns about Generation Z. And the statistics are, are pretty much there. You know, there's a lot, of, you know, intergenerational snark is always uh, going to be with us. From mm -hmm. the time of Socrates to Edgar Allan Poe and, you know, Norman Mailer. But the statistics for this generation are pretty stark. So the anecdotes are fine, but the statistics, even in Haight's book and Twenge's book, are, are really alarming. And so the second edition was really to address that, what is happening with Gen Z. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So one of, just having a quick look at uh, right up on your book, I haven't had the opportunity to read the book yet. One of the things you say is that 75% of parenting is done by age 12. Now, I would uh, intuitively agree with you, but I, I don't have the facts to back it up. So you you tell us why why you found that out or why you say that. Sure. Um, that statistic is from uh, 100 Hours Outside, which is a, a website um, associated with different parenting magazines and, you know, um, kind of the psychologist counseling parenting complex. 75% uh, of the time we spend with our kids by the age of 12, 90% by the time the kid is 18. 
And the key here is, Peter, that means you have really got to imbue the values and the qualities and behaviors you want in your kids when they're very young. Mm -hmm. Because by the time 12 comes along, you've either raised the kid or the culture has raised the kid. Yep. And, and if there's no reasonable person today will think that the culture raising your kid is a very, very good idea. Well, absolutely. I, you know, I may be going off on a tangent here, but you know, when we live in a society where both parents are typically working full-time jobs and many of the young children are now being raised, well, they are being raised by daycare centers for the better part of, of you know, most of their days. How does that factor in? How does, how, how do parents cope with that? Especially if you're trying to impart their values and, and how, how does that all work? Certainly. I can only go from my experience and the experience of many of my peers growing up here in Washington, D.C. Both me and my ex, this, the kid's son, son's, uh, the kid's mom, worked. And she helped run a private school. And I worked on Capitol Hill. So we had pretty, you know, fulsome jobs there. Uh, our kids wore, had a nanny. And then they went to school at the normal age, and they went to private school. Uh, so that is part of it, but that doesn't mean that the time after six or the time before eight o'clock in the morning or every evening mm -hmm. um, is a time that can be just wasted or just devalued. Parent, parental engagement is key. And I give you those examples because your, your observation is correct. Well, we were part of that and we were engaged and the book talks about, you know, the balance that you have. So I, I'm, I'm never going to really, you know, give parents a pass because I went through that as a, as a young father and then an older father as, along the way. Um, but it's a very, you, you know, you make a good observation, right? Both parents working and grinding it out so their, their kids can have, you know, obviously a better life. Right. And I, and I suppose is having to make the decisions of where you, you know, which nanny you hire or which uh, daycare centers you place them in that, you know, that, that reflect your values and, and even the schooling, because again, you know, you have public school, you have private school, there's so many different decisions to make um, as Correct. To where they go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so getting back to raising resilient kids, what are exactly the steps in raising them to be resilient? Sure. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to start, I'm going to, as you can already tell, I'm pretty unfiltered guy. So I'm going to start with a very hard observation sure. for all the parents listening here. You know, our job as parents is not just to build a relationship with our kids. Okay. We already have a relationship with them. That's why they call it parenting, not childing. Our job as parents really is to help our kids build a relationship with the real world outside that front door every day. And that's the school and the athletic fields. That's the, the hardware store, the mall, the church, the community, the neighborhood, the, the successes and failures, all the strangers, all the peers that we encounter in a typical day. That's where that kid's gonna be on his or her own, the bulk of their life. And if mm -hmm. they can't manage that world, they're doomed. A kid that is closeted, and we go back to you know what Peter noted about 12 years old, 75% of your time. If a kid has been kind of hovered over, you know, at the age of 14, at the age of 24, that kid's living in the basement playing Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just the facts. Right. And Absolutely. I go back to the statistics, 41% of kids between the 18 kids, young adults, between the ages of 18 and 32 are living at home. What I mean, percentage gosh, is that? 42%. 42%. 42%. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. An average kid between the ages of 10 and 18 is on their phone nearly nine hours a day, eight hours and 47 minutes. This is in Jonathan hey. Hayes' book. For kids three to five, it's an hour and 45 minutes. Ages three to five are on a screen an hour and 45 minutes a day. And of course, you see, when you have this passive 
just, you know, absorption of all, you know, the sewage that is on the interweb, mm -hmm. what happens is you not only do you have that kid at 24 living in your basement, but even if the kid has managed to get through college, here's this, the, the two stats that just, you know, say it all about this generation. And I don't say this with any glee because I have three kids in that generation and their peers, you know, are part of it. Hiring managers surveyed by three different firms, intelligentresumebuilder.com and Forbes. Six, 60% of new hires after a year are fired because they don't have 60%. the skills. 60%? 60%. They don't have the skills to make it in a workforce. But here's the best one. 35% of new college grads going to their first job interview with the hiring manager, bring their parents. <laughs> Let me say that again. 35% <laughs> of kids out of college going to the hiring manager for their first job interview, bring their parents. Bring their parents. Bring their parents. No, so, way. no way. That's what I'm saying. The accumulation of statistics from Dr. Haight, from Dr. Twenge, from Lenore, Skenazy. This is where we are today. And so that's one of one of the, one of the animuses are for the book, the second edition. And yeah. so yeah. to go back and, uh, you know, to Kathleen's great question, how do you build resilient kids? Well, you start with the values, because if you don't build a resilient kid and you don't do those things by the age of 12, that's going to be, you know, that's the outcome. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So I, I think we're, we've already answered this one, but I've got to ask the question. Well, let me make an observation. As, as a 70-plus something old white guy, I remember my parents allowing me to take risks that today would be considered neglectful parenting. At the age of seven, they bought me my first horse, and they were living in an outer suburb in Rhodesia with farmlands beyond. And I would get on my horse off to school in the afternoon with no hard hat and ride over these farms for two, three hours and come as long as I was home before dark and as long as I fed my horse and groomed it, cleaned it, sweet, put it away, no problem. Right? And uh, at the age of 12, uh, there was a pony club camp and very few people had horse trailers. And they said, well, you'll have to ride your horse there and it's about 30 miles and you've got to go around <laughs> the outskirts of the, you've got to go around the outskirts of the city and there's some traffic lights but you can do that. I said, sure. So my mother took me in a dry run in the car the day before, went back, set me off, went to the other end. I think she met me halfway with some sandwiches. And everyone thought that was normal. I tell people here yeah. what I did. They're horrified. You know, they're absolutely horrified. So so am I on track by saying, you know, one of the reasons our generation grew up more resilient is our parents let us take risks. And I did with my boys. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And, you know, we go back to a term you mentioned, right? in the beginning, Peter, you know, old school. Yeah. Uh, and what you're talking about really is, you know, independence. Yes. Yes. And, and that a kid's freedom to do what they can do on their own without yep. that. Again, like I said earlier, that hovering parent. Yeah. Um, you, you know, Lenore Skenazy talks about this in her let go program. Um, and you're, you're right. Kid, parents today are hovering. You know, it's the snowplow parent that flattens all obstacles in front or the helicopter parent helicopter that makes parent. sure that they're constantly viewing the kid. Um, I, I intuitively rejected that as an early age. And one of the first tests that I gave my kids going back to that real world was we were in a in massive indoor mall, you know, thousands of people, strange place, strange environment. And I opened up my wallet with the three boys there and the youngest was four and the oldest was seven. And I took out three $5 bills and I said, go get the old man change. It's not a race. I'll be standing right here, but don't come back unless you have change. And off they went. They were delighted to have a task like this, a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Of course, one kid struck out at a store. Another kid came back with 20 quarters in his pocket. But they all came back. And that was the first of numerous tests on their own doing something. Now, that doesn't yep. equate to riding a horse, you know, three miles without a helmet on. But in a modern age, that was the test. And, of course, it, would, sure. it accelerated and graduated to more tests. You know, we'd be in a restaurant and I'd point to the six-year-old and say, memorize everything we're going to order and you tell the waiter what we're going to have. Or, 
here's my here's my ATM card. Go get the old man three hundred bucks. Here's the password. Or we're going to change the oil on the car, and yeah. you're going to get oil in your face. But guess what? You're going to learn how to do it, and how that's at it. age eight. So you're right. Parents today, there's nothing, no tasks that they they will assign a kid that will allow them to just float out in that real world and get something done. Yeah. Wow. yeah and let me I just know. tell you something, too. Let yeah. me just add that. A kid that is five years old who brings back, you know, change for a five um, and is then given test after test after test like that throughout his, you know, preteen and adolescent life, that's the kid at 24 who's standing on the bridge of a guided missile destroyer in the Persian Gulf yep. at night with Iranian mines and gunboats all around him. And he's the one driving the boat responsible for 250 guys. Right. So right. they have that kind of resilience and that kind of pathway through making tough decisions that lasts when things are really on the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. No, you're right. So Kathleen, Jeff, back to you. Jeff, this may be just my observation, but it seems to me that today's generation they lack ambition. Yes. How would you guide ambition in a, in a in a kid? I, you know, Kathleen, I love to answer this question because it, it, it's it is, and it. I like the way you bring it up because it's something you notice. I think it's something everyone notices. Um, I think there's there's one of the biggest obstacles to, to that goes right to your question is we live in this strange age mm -hmm. where of self-obsession, which comes from nine hours on a phone and feelings overriding everything and people with their own truths and a grievance culture mm -hmm. where it seems like merit and performance seem to take a back seat. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, in the real world, it's not about feelings. It's about performance. It's always about performance. And, you know, I mean, there's examples in the book to talk about that. Um, one, when my sons and I were going to the big lacrosse tournament, we went to a private school on, on the, in the Eastern seaboard, very Tony place. And we're driving down the main drag and there's these signs up, justice and inclusion, diversity. <laughs> DER. <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of, yes, kind of that. And I we're reading them out out loud as we're driving by them. And then I said to my kid, I said, Yeah, you know, but GPA, SATs, all conference. And the kid's 10 years old and he's laughing out loud because he gets it. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not about feelings. He's going to play in a game in an hour where you don't, no one has feelings. It's who can hit harder and run faster and throw harder. And so I said, look, you're, I told him, I said, look, your man, your, your dad's all in for justice, baby. But guess what? In the real world, it's your coaches and your parents and your teachers, most of all, and your, the neighbors, they care about how you perform because that's how you're judged. And, you know, he got it. And at 10 years old, he gets it. So mm -hmm. I think that what that kind of ethos in the in the culture, Kathleen, it it permeates. And I think that cuts into that ambition and mm -hmm. that lack of drive. Yeah, absolutely. I, agree. I have um, a relative that is a, a school teacher. And I, I was shocked the one day when she was telling me that um, with her students, they, they played these games and I was like, throwing balls. I mean, these are young, very young children, but nobody can lose. Oh, no one can lose. Um, yeah. I, I, huh? Well, how does, how does this work? Yeah. You can't, <laughs> you, you know, you know, you can't just keep score and have one team win because everybody wins. Okay. Yeah. I just don't get this. I just, I, I, I have no idea where that comes from, but it's just, Oh yeah. yeah, we can't we can't hurt people's feelings, and it's just there all you go. Um, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, and there you I, go. I was, and you know, uh, Kathleen, Kathleen, yeah. that's such a great example because it's in schools everywhere, it's in places everywhere, you know. Um, and right, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Okay, well, I always when I get a lot of pushback when I talk about this, you know, 
I don't want to, I don't care what you feel, just perform for me. And then I still to say to someone who's, you know, skeptical or, you know, in that kind of woke bubble. And I'll say, you know, next time your kid brings home an F on a report card, you can smile at it and you can not even worry about performance. And of course, you know, they're, they're caught in a bind because they understand it. You know, the real world does, doesn't honor an F. It only honors an A. So, you but know, that school example good. is so perfect. And yeah. I don't know if things are this way in the United States, but here in Canada, well, at least where we are in Ontario, children don't fail anymore. God. They don't. No, no, right they here? don't. I mean, they just, they, they, that's right. And that's why 60% of newbies get, new hires get fired because they haven't been educated and they haven't been trained and they're not competent. Right. Yeah. And I don't know what the percentage now, I feel like I'm coming down on these, these, these poor kids, but I mean, I, I feel for them. Really, I do feel for them because um, I, I don't remember what the percentage is, but there's a lot of kids coming out of high school that can't even write. Mm -hmm. They can't read or write. I think that is so sad. Terrible. So I've got to change direction a little bit here because we can talk about this all day. It, it's a sure. huge hobby horse. <laughs> my question to you, and, and, I, and I have a reason for asking it because my experience in Africa, is the problem that we're seeing with the current generation of less resilient children unique to the first world of North America and, and Western Europe? Or do you see it in, in all across the world? You know, I that was when you sent me that question, I thought it was a great question. And um I've never been asked it before, but I tell you, I know the answer. Mm -hmm. And it's because of a woman named Dr. Michaeline Duclef. She's a correspondent for NPR, National Public Radio, here right. in the United States. She wrote a book called Hunt, Gather, Parent. Mm -hmm. And it was about her experience with her small child living in with some Mayan families. And then in Tanzania, mm -hmm. then in the Arctic Circle. And her observations were these kids in these cultures got tremendous amounts of responsibility from their parents and, it, you know, absorbed enormous independence. And she was stunned coming from, you know, her environment here in the United States to see this, to see these children, even at a young age, five or six, be given real tasks and real commitment to the whole community and to the family. So yes, I to answer your question, yeah, it, in the Western democracies where wealth and you know standards of living are so high that have it kind of allowed this. I'll say the word sloth, you know, but the other word is slacker. That kind of uh, mm -hmm. attitude or behavior to just flourish, and yeah. it's too too bad. Yeah. Let me tell you very briefly. I mean, this is about you, not about me, but I think you'll be interested in this little story that when I was on my farm in Zimbabwe, I employed at peak season 180 people. So I had around three to 400 extended family living on the farm and we supported on the farm. Right. So we weren't big enough to have our own school, but my neighbor had a bigger farm and my farm was big by Canadian standards, thousand acres, but small by African standards. So my neighbor farmed about 3000 acres. He had a farm school. And the system there was the Zimbabwe government couldn't afford to maintain adequate standards of education for the whole population. So they tended to subsidize farm schools, which, which was a workable solution. So the kids from my farm would walk barefoot in winter, which is not like a Canadian winter, but it, there's, it can be frost on the ground. And they would generally walk barefoot a couple of miles to school. They would fight for a place to get a desk or they would sit on the floor with an old secondhand school exercise book and a broken pencil. And they would walk home and do chores. And sometimes they would do piecework on the farm as well. And then they would sit by candlelight at night to do their homework. And they would work and work and work to try and raise their own standards up and, and make their life better. And many of those kids, not just from my farm, many Zimbabwean girls went to England and became nurses, qualified in Zimbabwe. And the majority of, I say the majority, but many, a significant number of nurses in the UK are black Zimbabwean and South African women, right? Doing a really good job because they've escaped the tribal culture and they worked under those terrible conditions to get an education. So I don't want to preach, but that was my experience, which bears out what, what you're saying, right? And and I've never forgotten that either, uh, the sacrifices they make to, to get an education. Right. Yeah. 
Mm. Sorry, I was going on a bit of a rant there. I do apologize. But uh, <laughs> Kathleen, I think it's back to you. Yes. All right. So, so Jeff, tell us what are the four lessons from your three sons you mentioned in your book? Sure. Uh, again, I'll go back to the old school mantra, the unfiltered mantra. Uh, it was real simple. You know, sitting down that afternoon, thinking about what, you know, where they had, where they had come from to where they were. It was just four things, personal courtesy and conduct, you know, uh, confidence, building confidence, resilience and adversity, which may be more important than anything because no one gets a free ride, no adult, no kid. You hit an obstacle this week or this day, and guess what? There's going to be another one in a few days or in a few weeks. And the last one, and Kathleen, you covered it, ambition, how to develop ambition in a kid. And so... I took stories from throughout their lives to emphasize those four qualities that really had contributed to where they were at that, at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And I will say that in the book, I took, I take a lot of shots at myself where I made mistakes and, you know, had to acknowledge, you know, the error or the humiliation sometimes, or just use myself in ex as an example to say, look, you know, Probably the, one of the most important parts of the book was the end of talking about ambition back to you, Kathleen, was driving around Washington, D.C. all the time in northern Virginia. You know, you see these massive office buildings, you know, 15, 20 stories, and they're just row by row, you know, steel and brick and iron and glass and then big office parks in the suburbs, same kind of thing. And we, we were always mystified and kind of amazed by them, just that, you know, they just were haunting. And so we drive around and one day I decided to make a point to him. And I said, hey, you know, we're driving in D.C. And I said, you know, you look up there on that seventh floor. I said, there's a guy sitting there behind a desk and he's got a picture of his family on the wall and a coffee mug like you made me in second grade, you know, sitting on his desk. And he's staring at the screen. And, you know, he was going to be somebody who's going to be a jet pilot or he's going to own a bunch of real estate or be in the restaurant business with his cousin or sail around the world. But no, you know, he's sitting there staring at that screen and he's saying, what the hell am I doing here? And I said, that guy is your dad. So you have got to get a hell of a lot farther than I got. And just silence because, and we're going to the ambition part. They realized, you know, they had a pretty good life, but that wasn't enough. And the old man was admitting it to him right up straight. And so, as my point was, I took shots of myself in the book. No, it wasn't some easy, you know, circus ride and oh. parades and everything. It was tough. And sometimes I'd get fired from jobs because in politics, if you're on the south side of an election, you're gone. You know, you clean out your desk the next day. So I had to, you know, I made examples of that and explaining to him, hey, your, your old man got fired, but he's going to come back. We're going to rally. And you know what? That's that's the way you have to handle these things. And of course, they were shocked that I got fired. But and but being authentic really counts a lot even yeah. when things are really bad, because it gives them, you know, the idea and the opportunity to think, hey, if, if he got out of it, I can get out of what I'm going yeah. through right now at six, mm -hmm. you know, in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, no, very good. Jeff, so I. If can I just jump in one more time here, Peter? Carry on, yeah. Kathleen, carry on. You talk about having made some mistakes. And I'm 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 kind of curious. Yeah. Would you mind sharing maybe what what you would have considered a mistake that you made? Sure. Uh I wrote them hard sometimes, too hard. Um, academically, athletically, uh so in social situations. And they would come back at me. And I you know, I, one of the examples I use in the book is I was riding the eldest kid to run for student body office at his school. And I kept going after him. I say, look, man, you know, a lot of guys and gals, you know, you're good on your feet. Um, this will look good on your record down the line. And I kept nagging him and nagging him. And finally he turns to me one night when I'm nagging him again and he's doing his homework and he looks up at me, and goes, dad, I know what I'm doing here. And I just shut up. I said, you know, you're right, and I'm wrong, and I'm never going to bring it up to you again. 
And so those were the times where I was wrong and had to confront it and admit to them that, hey, your dad's out of bounds here, man, and it's not going to happen again. So, yeah, there's every, every dad makes mistakes. You know, there's no perfect dad like there's no sure. perfect kid. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah, and I can look back as well and think of many mistakes that I made. Uh, some had some fairly serious consequences. But anyway, here's one for you that I, I thought of while you were talking, and I've mentioned this to other people. I went through national service and I did mine in the military, right? And although, as you know, from your military experience, a lot of a lot of serving in the military is boring and uh, soul destroying and it's interspersed <laughs> with short periods of sheer terror and all the rest. We all know that. <laughs> However, looking back, it's one of the best things that I did because it teaches you so many things. When you go in, I went in when I was just before I was 19, I guess, for my first nine months and then got into a few hairy situations, but nothing too serious. But that overall experience. So I am suggesting that one of the ways to fix this generation and, and generations are coming is to bring in national service, not necessarily the military. I would say every youngster finishes high school before they go to university, they serve a year for their country, break it up into three different categories. For instance, one serving old age homes, two different jobs, so they get a taste of different occupations, and they get paid minimum wage. I think it would benefit the country, it would benefit the children, it would benefit the parents. What's your thought? It's radical, but what's your thoughts on that? I, be- I believe in national service, like you said. Uh, I can tell you in the military, I mean, having served as the sure. Army, Army Reserve and Guard and having three sons who are active duty officers. The military doesn't want to draft. They don't want to take the kids that they get. I mean, you've got to realize in this country, Peter, 72% of the kids of military age, that is between the ages of 18 and 24, cannot get into the service. They They're have health, health problems, mostly obesity and medication. They have law enforcement or disciplinary records, right. or they can't pass the basic military, you know, entrance test. That's seventy-two percent. Seventy-two percent. And that that number is always is quoted, even I want to say a couple months ago, by generals testifying before Congress about recruiting. I also know because my middle son getting off the ship after four years around the world, the guided missile destroyer is a military recruiter in Cincinnati. And he can barely, barely find guys. He recruits for naval officers in aviation and in uh, nuclear engineering. So you've already, in in this country, you've got seven out of 10 kids couldn't even get in the service because once they got there, they might die. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously the health Mm -hmm. problems. Um, So about the national service thing, I agree. my biggest fear would be it just turn into another bureaucracy. You know, yeah. you can send a lot of good meaning kids down into the inner cities to try and rectify things. I mean, come on, let's get real. Is that going to yeah. help? You know, right. um, but I agree. I agree. There's got to be some kind of giving back to this country. Um, or there's got to be punishment. Oh know? yeah. I mean, for sure. Um, some, you know, you're going to go to college, but you're going to pay every cent of the bill. So there's no loans anymore. So no. you're going to take it seriously or you're not going to go. You're not going to go. That's college right. is college. We have this myth that college is for everybody. It's not for everybody. Oh, no. right. Because um, my generation, it was the exception in, in the British uh, education system, both in Britain and Southern Africa, that was Rhodesia and South Africa. Uh, when I finished high school in the late 60s, and I would say maybe 30 percent and I was in the top academic stream at my school. I, I had a clear shot at university, but I chose to go farming. I would say 30, not more than 30% of the boys in my high school would go to university. They would go to apprenticeships, they'd go into business, they would do this, that, and the next thing. But a very small minority went to university. That was then. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, guess, and guess what? You know, universities aren't for everybody. Being an electrical, you know, being an electrician isn't for everybody either. No. No, for sure. You know, that, sure. Just, being a cook in a restaurant isn't for everybody. Sure. So I, it's not just it's not just being in a classroom. There's a lot of things that you know. Equality is great. Equity is a fantasy. It's a fantasy, absolutely. Right. So, right. Well, you you know what? Uh, my goodness, we could 
have a chat here for another couple of hours, I'm sure, but we are running, We're running out of time. we Sorry. are running out of time. So, so tell us how do people contact you and how can they get your books? Certainly. Um, I have a website. It's www.nelliganbooks.com. Okay. And all my books on parenting are on that site. I have a Twitter feed. Uh, it's Resilient Sons. Um, I'm on Facebook, Jeff Nelligan Books. And I'm on Instagram at Nelligan underscore books. Okay. Get all this. Excellent. Peter? Well, that was good. So have I got time, Kathleen, to ask Jeff my important question? Oh, that by yes, all means. We, yes, let's do we, it. We ask, we ask all our guests, our expert guests like you, for one tip. You know, there's a lot of negativity in the world, and we've been a bit negative on the Generation Z right at the moment but, and the millennials. But um, Kathleen and I are not negative. We, we, we've been through enough to see opportunities ahead. What's one tip you could give you know, parents of younger children who are just new to the parenting game and, and uh, inundated with all this advice from society? What's one tip you could give them to help them develop resilient kids? Sure. And I'll make it in less than 60 seconds. How about that? <laughs> uh, parents, I hope you're listening now, dads and moms, you have to have a strategy. Mm -hmm. And that strategy for raising that kid has got to kick in it three, four, five, it's got to look, got to involve looking at the kid and deciding what values are most important to you. And then sending that kid out in the real world with the tests, like I've decided, like yeah. I've explained before, the tests where the kid has to operate on his own, because that's where that kid's going to be after the age of 12. And in terms of three actionable items, here you go. Number one, no screens. If three to five-year-olds are sucking uh, almost two hours a day of screens, we have a problem. No screens at all. Number two, you spend an hour, an hour a day reading to that kid, or if the kid is reading, sitting next to him and reading your own book. And third, you get that kid out 45 minutes to an hour every day outside the front door, walking in the neighborhood or walking in a park and just walking and taking in nature. The last thing, Routine time every week to sit that kid down alone and just talk. So I started that with my kids at the age of five, an hour at the most peaceful place on the planet, high school bleachers on a Saturday morning. Five years old, I had the same talk two weeks ago with a 29-year-old kid who had just come through on, after a deployment through Washington, D.C. 24 years we've been having those discussions in those bleachers. Right. So this stuff can be done. And those are five ways you can do it. Well yeah. done. Thank you very much. Excellent advice. And for me, thank you, Jeff. Thanks to our audience for listening. And I'll hand back to Kathleen to close off. Jeff, I'd love to have you back on the show. We, As I said, we could probably go on and chat for another couple of hours. You've been <laughs> wonderful. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you all again for tuning into our show. We so appreciated having you. And if anyone is interested in being a guest on our show, we invite you to visit us at theyackingshow.com. All you need to do is click on the contacts tab and fill out a short application form. We would love to hear from you. So until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.